Let's start. Hello everyone, my name is Peter Boros and I work as a consultant at Persona and we will talk about SysBench and benchmarking uh, in general and a bit about benchmarking in general. Uh, this talk is beginner level, so you would benefit the most from this if you have ever seen SysBench or did very little stuff with it. This is mostly uh, based on my experience that when I helped people about benchmarks, that what was useful for them and it's kind of condensed uh, into this talk. So we will talk about benchmarking in general. We will talk about benchmarking uh, I/O subsystems with SysBench I/O. We will talk about benchmarking MySQL with SysBench, and I will give you some tips on how did I produce the graphs I used because last time I uh, did this talk, this was the first question. So what is a bench? What is a benchmark? A benchmark is a synthetic workload. And, with, uh, and it doesn't represent a real life workload, but it is really good for comparison. And you can measure your system's benchmark or you can simulate your actual workload. But the actual workload, <coughs> the actual workload, uh, simulation of the actual workload, uh, is a lot less repeatable than the benchmark, but the benchmark is not, not necessarily close to the uh, real code of your application. So it's like with everything in IT, you can choose if your testing method will start this way or that way, right? So, or you can put it better that uh, an engineer's job is to make the right compromises. SysBench is pretty easy to use. Uh, I recommend to always use Trunk, 0.5 SysBench. This is how you can compile it. Fred creates nice packages for Red and Fedora out of it. I always use this stuff, almost. So, let's, uh, let's do uh, a file IO benchmark. I, uh, this is how you create a set of files for file IO. Uh, we create 32 gigs of files here, the number of files are 32, so each file is one gig, and the prepare command will create the files which the test will be performed on. And the benchmarks which I will discuss were made on my laptop, so they are readily reproducible. All, all this was benchmarking my laptop SSD. So, there are some parameters which uh, we will use during the benchmark. First is the block size. We will use 16 feet because that's the only the page size. We will use the total size of files and the file and the number of files. The number of files can be important because some file systems like ext3 and ext4 have certain bottlenecks on, uh, on writing the I/O table. So if you do it with only one file, you may uh, you may need that. And the database is usually more fast as well. We will use direct IO. Uh, we will initialize the random numbers, uh, the pseudo random numbers uh, at the beginning uh, of the benchmark. So we won't hit a bottleneck on random number generation. We will vary the number of threads. We will use, uh, we will test synchronous and asynchronous I.O. and we will test random reads, writes, and random reads, writes in, in mix. Okay, we will also use the next requests parameter, uh, so we don't limit the benchmark based on requests, the next time parameter, and we will capture the matrix every second. So, this is how the output looks like. This is a write test. Uh, this field shows you the sample, um, read throughput, write throughput, f-sync uh, rate, the response time for the given operation, and the response time is 95th uh, percent and response time. And when I said that uh, we vary the number of threads, does this actually matter, right? We are benchmarking the laptop SSD. A laptop SSD can do a thousand IOPS or two thousand or whatever. It's a parameter of the SSD. Do we have to bother with threads? 
Yes, probably. Uh, the correct answer for this is it depends, which happens to be the correct answer for 95% of data based related questions. So, uh, in case of synchronous I.O., uh, our first test, we will wait until the I.O. request completes and only then, uh, only then have the result. In case of asynchronous I.O., we don't wait until, until the completion of the I.O. request, but rather check back later and, and see how it goes. So in case of uh, in case of asynchronous I/O, adding more threads or removing them doesn't matter that much because we are not doing busy waves. In case of synchronous, the number of synchronous I/O, the number of threads uh, we will use matter a lot. Uh, you will see it for uh, from benchmark results. And I like to show stuff live, so I wrote a little script which just does the which just does the fine label. What? What's it? Yes, yes. So my laptop can do like 44 megs in this test. If we check the if we check the demo then we see that this is synchronous I.O. on a single thread. Does it matter if I change the block size here, right? I have an SSD in this laptop. So if I read smaller or larger blocks, will, will it matter? To put the question differently, is sequential or random I.O. Uh, behaves differently on SSD? We are so lucky that I have this laptop here, so we can try. If I set the block size to, let's say, 1 man, it will be a lot faster. So, uh, the nature of I.O., if it's sequential or random, uh, still matters uh, on flash storage, but not as, much, uh, not as much as on spindles, just the boundaries are in different places. I just changed the block size to 1K, and for 1K blocks, uh, performance will suck. It will, it, it will be slower and slower if I lower the block size, but if I lower it under 4K, which is the physical block size of the device, here I'm not writing one, I never write 1K, I always write 4K at the physical level. So this is why uh, after a, or if a block size, uh, if the block size reaches a, a certain core, uh, a certain size, then it, it will get uh, a lot more slow. So this is a graph of the write throughput uh, of my laptop in case of asynchronous I/O, and we decided uh, this has that the number of threads doesn't matter. And this is a graph on the uh, graph on the response time in milliseconds. And let's stop a bit here. Is this graph good? Why not? Because otherwise I wouldn't ask, right? So what is not visible from this graph, right, that the response time is around between 10 and 20 milliseconds. But is it more like 10? Is it more like 20? What's the distribution, right? That's why I like jitter plots, because uh, from this plot we will see that 10 is more frequent, because we have more frequent samples, and we can see that it's more like an either-or relationship, that uh, sometimes it's 20, but more or less it's 10. And it, um, the other good answer for is that graph valid is that can we measure the response time accurately in case of asynchronous I.O.? And we can't, because we don't wait for the completion of the actual I.O. We will check back later if the I.O. operation is completed, and we can record the time when we get the results from that check, but at that time the I.O. operation may be uh, completed uh, for a while. Okay, 
So this is again the the write throughput, and here it is visible that the read throughput uh, of my SSD is much higher. So it can write, it can read much faster than it can write. And uh, we can also see that the read performance is consistent. For from the jitter plots, I like to, uh, to use alpha channel for the individual individual dots. So if they plot it on top of each other, it will show a, a sharper color. And here you can see the, the read response time. Sysbench can also do, uh, do mixed throughput. And this is one rookie error that uh, you know, usually people make that, OK, my storage can do 400 megs of reads. So it will be OK. But as soon as you mix them, the, the read performance, the characteristics of, uh, of read performance will change. So if I do reads and writes at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm not able to do 400 meg read throughput anymore. So it seems, and here is the response time of this graph, and the the red one is the read, the uh, read throughput, and the blue one is the is the write. Okay, so in last November I started a MySQL instance, and it wrote that it is using Linux native asynchronous I/O, and I told you at the beginning that we will discuss results for synchronous I/O. So, do we have to do it at all, or we can stop here? Because it doesn't matter. It does matter. Uh, asynchronous I/O is used for uh, checkpointing, but for example, the read loads are written synchronously, and this is the synchronous write throughput. Uh, and this graph doesn't have time in the x-axis, but rather the, the factor of the, of the number of threads. And if you, can, if you check this one, so the, the bright throughput at a single thread, why is this, why is this important? In my SQL 5.5 and in 5.6 if you have a single schema. Because replication is single threaded, right? Which means that uh, that replication can't go faster than this. Why the the throughput of my storage at 16 megs is a lot better. Uh, 16 threads is a lot better. Hmm? CPU. 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 The number of cores. Two. So, the, but the benchmark is not CPU intensive. No, I mean, that's right. Yes, so I use this many strands, but this laptop has two CPU cores. Yes. Okay. So, if you graph the response time, you can see that up to a point, up to 16 strands, uh, the response time somewhat increases. But after a while, if I keep adding, Threads, the throughput doesn't change too much, but the response time will skyrocket, right? So, and this is another you know point to make that every system has uh, has an optimal degree of parallelism, and if you go over that, then you will get horrible response times. And this is why it is a it is a bad idea to set uh, max connections for MySQL to 10, 20,000 or something like that, because if you start using all of them, this, uh, this will happen. Similarly for reads, so if I use more threads, the uh, read throughput uh, will increase. But uh, again, similarly, the, the response time will just blow up after a while. And this is for reads. So similarly, my my read uh, performance in isolation was pretty good, but if I if I do mix uh, a mixed benchmark, I won't be able to do uh, 400 megs for reads anymore, and the response time uh, the response time is pretty similar. So. Uh, after a while, the throughput doesn't grow, but the response time uh, starts, to, starts to grow exponentially. OK, 
Okay, uh, so so far this was file I/O, benchmarking uh, benchmarking your I/O subsystem, and now let's talk about uh, benchmarking MySQL. Here is how you can prepare a test database. So you create a schema and use that schema and use the parallel prepare the Lua script uh, to create uh, create your test database in parallel. And here is how how do you do one benchmark iteration. One more thing with with this is usually uh, usually you write scripts like this that for all test modes for all io modes for all set configurations you do the benchmark and at the end uh, you will aggregate it similarly for uh, this is how a typical <laughs> typical ortp bench, uh, benchmark looks like that you vary the number of sets and you measure these sets. If you want to vary another parameter, then, then you can do it as well. So I recommend to write uh, basic wrapper scripts like this. Uh, the, I think the most well known benchmark in uh, Sysbench is ORTP. It has some parameters like the table size and uh, it has some parameters for its queries as well, like uh, what should the range size be, how many point selects should be in a transaction, how many simple ranges should be in a transaction. This is, by the way, in, uh, in Sysbench in Commando Tour, so you can find the definition in Commando Tour. And for database benchmark, I chose to examine uh, a workload, now which reconnects uh, reconnects pretty frequently. So we won't do we won't do the OLTP benchmark now, but I, I would like to show you how can you use this bench to uh, to reproduce uh, you know an issue which you may see in the production environment uh, in kind of a sandbox by modifying uh, modifying the Lua. So let's edit <coughs> <coughs> Let's examine to my bench. Let's examine the update index.lua, which uh, we will use for this. And I modified this script a bit that at the, in the event function, I do a db disconnect, which means that and after every transaction, sysbench will disconnect from the database. So what do I simulate here? Let's say a PHP application where the PHP interpreter only runs while the HTTP request is alive and every time it will reconnect to MySQL. So if I do the benchmark without the reconnect, then it will be okay. So this is the throughput we get for updating, uh, updating uh, sing by single binary key on 32, 32 threads. Here the tables used in the benchmarks are, uh, benchmark is rather small, so all of this is in memory. But if I add the disconnect back, and do it again, then uh, for a while it will be kind of okay. You can also see that uh, in my SQL the connections are, uh, are cheap, so it doesn't matter that much uh, if you are reconnecting or not, it matters a little. And now my SQL sucks, right? Oh, it sucks again, and again. What happened? My SQL is not running. Yes, it is running. Oops. It sucks again, still. What happened here? Hmm? No? Also, it's in time wait. Yes. So, the issue here is that when you, when you close a MySQL connection, 
the protocol level, the MySQL protocol level close doesn't close the, the TCP IP level connection. So if if I if I check all sockets will be timely, and here I'm actually out of the local uh, IP and port range for TCP IP. How can I fix that? I can limit the number of connections. <coughs> the number of connections at the kernel level that, uh, that can be in time rate. If I limit this, then I can't have more than a thousand connections in time rate. The kernel will, uh, will simply kill it, and my benchmark is fixed now. Okay, and this will run like forever because I won't uh, won't go out of out of the local uh, of the port range anymore. So if we do this again. We keep at roughly a thousand because the rest is killed by the kernel. If we check what happens here, no, it's not here. But uh, here, if your traffic is high enough, then the kernel can complain that it killed TCP/IP connections. I tried to break my SQL connections with that, and I wasn't successful. So, looks like this, these TCP/IP connections are there for like, no reason. When, when you, call, when you close, the, uh, close the MySQL level uh, connection, the server doesn't initiate the TCP IP level connection, but it is initiated by the client later, so the connection will be reused. I don't know if, it's, uh, if it would, probably it would be better to, for the server to initiate the TCP IP connection close when, uh, when the client thread is closed. Okay, so thank you everyone. One more thing, which I almost forgot. My colleagues and friends, friends from Belgium are organizing a community dinner. And they asked me to show these slides. I haven't seen them myself, so I will check it out with you and improvise. This is the first one. There will be three. It has some nice logos on it. I guess that they are the companies who are sponsors, right? Yes, OK. In this slide, there are some text and the map. And the text says, uh, which bus should you take to get to the community dinner? So this is kind of a useful information part. And here is bus and table. So you don't have to stand in the rain.